please welcome Dmitry Alperovich. Good morning, RSA. Great to be with you. Thank you so much for making it. I imagine a lot of you had a late light night last night, went around the various parties that are out here, but I really appreciate you coming. My name is Dmitry Alperovich, and <clears throat> I really, when I was thinking about <clears throat> opening up this uh, keynote, I really wanted to do a joke at the expense of a certain Richard Cranian, but I'm afraid I don't know any. If you don't get that, you can come talk to me after the talk. <clears throat> but first of all, I want to address the elephant in the room, and I'm not talking about a new adversary, but a few of you may have seen my announcement last week that I have left CrowdStrike, a company that I co-founded um, almost nine years ago now. And I wanted to take a moment to explain the reasoning for that, and share with you my thoughts on the future. Uh, so a few of you that know me uh, may know that when I was working on my college degree, first in computer science and then graduate degree in cybersecurity or information security, as it was called back 20 years ago, I also had a passion um, and took uh, a lot of classes in international affairs. And then when I went into industry after college, I always assumed that I would never use that part of my brain again in my professional life and that I would be spending it in the tech sector working on some of these challenging problems that we have in this field. And for the first 10 years of my career, that was pretty much true. Yet in 2010, something happened. Uh, an attack called Operation Aurora, which I ended up working uh, on and ended up naming. And that attack really changed everything. It brought to the fore in our industry, of course, this term APT. Um, it got everyone to recognize that nation states were a huge problem. And even more importantly, it got noticed by politicians in Washington, national security types that have never really cared much about these issues, realized suddenly that in this realm we work on geopolitics, that uh, geopolitics is driving a lot of the challenges that we are seeing now in this field. And ever since then, that, of course, has been amplified and amplified um, even in, in recent years, as you have seen from the news. So as uh, I started thinking about this, and, and uh, shortly after Operation Aurora, I ended up starting CrowdStrike to work on the technical and intelligence part of this problem to try to solve it from that angle. And um, obviously, uh, we've had great success, and I'm uh, really uh, grateful for, um, for the run that I've had there. But as I'm looking at the next phase of my career, I really wanted to focus on the other side of the problem, which is the policy side, which is becoming more and more important. And uh, I'm going to be launching a policy accelerator, a nonprofit that I'm starting to work on these issue issues, identify solutions, and try to get them in front of policymakers to try to get to legislative and executive branch um, decisions on these really critical issues. And I hope a lot of you will help me on this journey. I'm in need of ideas. And uh, this is one of the ways that I want to give back to the community. But specifically, uh, more relevant to this talk, this talk is going to be a little bit different from prior talks uh, that I've given on the stage over the years, because it will be less of a highlight of specific hacking techniques, uh, but more of a broad global threat review of what we have seen and some of my thoughts on strategy going forward. And with the recent announcement, what you're getting is really the unvarnished Dimitri for the first time in over 15 years that I've been on the stage speaking. Uh, I'm not representing any commercial company. Uh, for better or for worse, you, I'm an, unencumbered by that, uh, and uh, you're getting the straight uh, talk directly from me. So with that, let's jump in. <clears throat> 2019. You know, the other thing that's been happening over the last 10 years as I've been coming to this conference talking about the things that we've been seeing from the different threat actors, almost exclusively it has been about nation states, really since Aurora and since China came to the fore um, with their hacks into these technology companies, including Google, people have been thinking through, you know, what are nation states doing, not just China, but later Russia and Iran and North Korea and a whole slew of different actors. But 2019 was really, really different because the major story was actually not nation states. It was ransomware. And so many organizations that I've talked to over the years um, but specifically in the last year, have been experiencing this issue. And there are a couple of drivers behind that. One has been really the invention of cryptocurrency. 
Ransomware is not a new phenomenon. In fact, some of the earliest versions of ransomware appeared in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, but at the time, when it would encrypt your data, it would literally pop up a message on your system in the DOS days back then saying, here's the wire uh, instructions to wire the money to the bank account. As you can imagine, uh, not very hard for law enforcement to trace back to the ownership of that bank account and try to find the perpetrators. So ransomware didn't really pick up until the invention of Bitcoin and some of these alternative cryptocurrencies. And then it slowly started to take off. But 2019 really was the year of ransomware. And the problem with ransomware these days is that they're adopting the techniques of nation states, living off the land, uh, also leveraging uh, what some in the industry call big game hunting, the idea that you're going to uh, infiltrate an organization, move laterally, get administrative credentials, have as much access as possible, and then all at once deploy your uh, uh, crypto ma malware uh, in that organization and um, really try to have as much operational impact as possible. So we've been seeing that a lot, and I'll talk more about some of the groups that we've been seeing and some of the latest trends in that realm. But the other trend really is that China and Russia, sort of the actors we talk about often at these conferences, have taken a back seat to some of the other nation states that are uh, becoming more and more prevalent in this arena. And some of them, new actors that perhaps you haven't paid much attention to in the past. And you know, for 20 or 30 years now, I've been hearing politicians and other experts talk about how we would see this proliferation of threat actors, how so many countries out there are building military capabilities in this domain, how they're buying cyber tools from others or, or building their own. But for the most part, that hasn't been relevant to you in this industry because those actors, while out there, have mostly focused on traditional national security targets. It's been sort of government on government diplomatic spying, counterterrorism operations. In the case of some regimes, um, if you're a journalist or an activist um, or um, a dissident, uh, you, you may have been a uh, victim of some of those operations. But by and large, the vast population out there, and certainly in the commercial sector, really didn't have to care about those actors. That is starting to change. And in addition to North Korea and Iran, we're starting to see other countries get into the game of doing cyber operations against the commercial sector. Vietnam and Pakistan are the more notable ones as they're increasing their op tempo and really getting into this intellectual property theft uh, game. I'll talk more about that. Russia, surprisingly, stayed pretty low-key in 2019. Very few operations that were observed, mostly in their own sort of regional sphere. And uh, that may not necessarily continue to the future, but for the time being, they were not the dominant story uh, in the cyber domain. However, on the China front, we continue to see intellectual property theft unabated. There was a brief period of sort of quietness after the Obama-Xi agreement that was struck in 2015, where China committed to not engaging in economic espionage through cyber means. That agreement lasted for about a year, year and a half, and then they started resuming their activity. But one of the things that has dramatically changed in the last few years is that the military, the PLA, that was responsible for the vast amount of operations that we had been seeing from China really has disappeared. And now most of the operations are being conducted by the Ministry of State Security. Um, it's sort of a hybrid of CIA and FBI is a good way to think about that in terms of the authorities within China. And they heavily leverage co contractors, and some of them have been indicted by the Justice Department. So let's dig in into some of these phenomena. On ransomware in particular, what's been really amazing to watch is the rapid evolution in ransomware attacks. So Riot, one of the most popular ransomware families out there that are continuously hitting all types of small businesses, school districts, even larger companies, has only been around for about 18 months. The uh, gang, grab, uh, get, gang crab uh, malware, very, very popular, very, very successful, um, was shut down last May, and a new variant, our evil, has reappeared a short, uh, a short few months later. So we're seeing a lot of iterations that are taking place, and a lot of capabilities are being developed. One of the recent uh, capabilities that was developed for Ryak, for example, is the ability for it to spread, even for devices that are sleeping, and using the wake on land feature to wake them up, mount their uh, shares via SMB protocol, and then encrypt all the files on those devices. 
allowing them, of course, to have much more impact and spread much more widely within their organizations. Typically, those ransomware attacks are being delivered through other Trojans that may arrive in spam emails, like Emotet and TrickBot, uh, and most of them are operated by Russian cyber criminal groups these days. Ransom payments are going up as well, um, but you can negotiate them. So um, if you do fall victim and if you end up for, uh, being forced to pay a ransom, know that you don't have to pay the sticker price. It's a little bit like the used car lot. Um, they, do, they are receptive to negotiations, and I have seen companies that have been very successful at dramatically lowering the initial price that is being requested. But paying a ransom may not always solve your problems. It's not just that thieves have no honor and um, they may actually not give you the decryption programs after you pay them, although in most cases, particularly in these well-known ransomware operations, they do, in fact, um, give you the, the, the programs. But I know of a case, uh, a case recently, I was talking to this company that said that they actually paid ransom. It was for Ryuk uh, infection, and they got the decryption program but the decryption program was buggy, not malicious, but just buggy, and it ended up taking down their infrastructure even further um, as a result of um, them executing this. As you can imagine, um, these criminals don't necessarily have sophisticated testing infrastructures, and to the extent that they test anything, it's gonna be their original malware so that they can be used on as many systems as possible, and the decryption program may very well be an afterthought. The good news here, though, is that those operations are not instant you have time to respond. In many of these cases, the time from the initial intrusion by one of these adversaries into your network to the time when they can actually deploy the ransom program across your environment is measured in days. So don't think that just because you got an emetet infection that immediately you're gonna have your network be encrypted. They, they tend to lie low, they tend to do reconnaissance in the environment, elevate privileges, get as much access to the network as possible so that they can have that maximum effect when they deploy their malware. The other um, thing that I often hear from companies is they tell me, well, we have backups, we're good. So even in the worst case scenario, we didn't stop something, we can restore. Um, I was talking to this one company that uh, ended up paying a ransom as well. <clears throat> and I asked them, did you have backups? And they said, well, yes, we did. Um, were they encrypted? No, um, they're stored off site, uh, we're good. So I was confused, why would you pay a ransom? And they told me, well, it would take too long to restore from backups, and it would ca uh, cause them a greater operational impact than paying the ransom of a few hundred thousand dollars. So make sure that you practice your disaster recovery techniques. Uh, just because you have it doesn't mean that you can restore quickly, and you may be forced into a decision of having to pay a criminal to restore your data, uh, even though you have access to it. Now let's talk about some of the other nation states that I mentioned. Pakistan is one that has probably not been much on your radar lately. And there were good reasons for that. Uh, this is an actor that's been around for a number of years. Uh, various companies call it by different names, APT36, Mythic Leopard, Operation Transparent Tribe, and on and on and on. And traditionally, they've been targeting India. So unless you're an Indian company, unless you're an Indian government, it really wasn't um, a threat actor that you were paying much attention to. But lately, that's been changing. They've been expanding more and more into targeting other governments, NATO operations for espionage purposes, some of the UN organizations, but recently also Western industry. And there's been great reporting on that from a number of firms looking at this issue because Pakistan is now realizing that the Chinese model, the model that they invented, 20 years ago, that you can leverage cyber to effectively steal intellectual property for the benefit of your own domestic industry is something that can be applied by many, many other countries. And that's one of the trends that you'll see throughout this presentation is how more and more nation states are getting into this IP theft game. Unfortunately, we didn't stop China early enough. The government really did not pay much attention to this until relatively recently. And we're now paying the price, not just in terms of all the intellectual property that have been stolen by the Chinese government from Western networks, but now also, of course, other countries jumping into the space. And really, we've established a de facto norm where we've told the world that we will tolerate this activity, that stealing intellectual property from the commercial sector, giving it to your own companies, is okay. And we've got to get back to deterrence and that's another thing that I think um, the policymakers really need to think through these days. By the way, the Pakistan capabilities are growing sophistication. 
Um, they started out with pretty simple .NET type of uh, remote access tools. And over time, as you can expect with any of these uh, uh, threat actors, they've gotten better and better over time. Vietnam also is taking note. This is, again, an actor that's been around for a number of years. Uh, Ocean Lotus was one of its original names, o Ocean Buffalo, APT32, and other names that various industry groups call it. And initially, it was really focused on China. As you can imagine, Vietnam is very close to its big neighbors. So some of the initial reporting on the threat, act threat actor actually came from Chinese security firms. However, over time, it expanded to other regional targets, Cambodia and uh, actually targets inside Vietnam that may have been um, targeted for law enforcement operations by the uh, Vietnamese government. But now we're seeing more and more activity from them in the IP theft space. The, the big foray um, into that came in really 2017, 2018, uh, when industry started seeing them in the automotive sector. A number of huge automotive companies some with presence in Vietnam started getting hit uh, by the, these Vietnamese operations. Intellectual property uh, was stolen. This was not their first foray into IP theft. In fact, Fire, I published a great report on this a few years ago where they documented some of the early operations going back a number of years. Uh, but they were limited in scope and, and mostly uh, focused on regional targets. This was one of the big ones that targeted Western firms. And they really weren't paying attention to the threat, threat actor. And in 2019, they started to expand into other sectors as well. Iran. Lots of different actors operating out of Iran, some tied to the IRGC, some tied to their Ministry of um, Intelligence, MOIS. They have different priorities. Some of these groups target dissidents, uh, people inside Iran, those that help them on the outside. Some of them go after intellectual property. Uh, there is a a great indictment by the uh, Justice Department about a year ago of this institute in Tehran uh, that was responsible for operations against universities and private sector firms where the Iranians were breaking in and stealing intellectual property uh, from those organizations to leverage for their own domestic industries in sectors that are strategic for Iran. However, there is also potentially a military component to these operations as well. So one of the actors, Charming Kitten, APT35, Peres2, called by different names, Iran-based adversary that has traditionally focused on strategic intelligence collection, both in the US and against Middle Eastern targets um, like the Saudis and others that the Iranians may be interested in. And you, you saw a bunch of really um, uh, disturbing kinetic operations recently from Iran where they targeted the Saudi oil facility, of course, with the drone attack. And uh, prior to that, uh, targeted international shipping with uh, limpet mines that were attached to those shipping operations. And it's quite possible, and there's a lot of research that's been done into this right now, of whether operations, cyber operations perhaps by those actors to do reconnaissance before those military operations took place. You have to figure out where those ships are. You have to do reconnaissance against those oil facilities. So more research to be done there. But increasingly, we're starting to see this combination of using cyber for reconnaissance for traditional kinetic operations that are taking place. North Koreans, they've really gotten into high gear lately, particularly in 2019. Um, and on this particular threat actor, I have to say the media reporting has been particularly bad. Um, there's been a lot of confusion and talk of this Lazarus group, which really is an amalgamation of many different groups that um, are inside North Korea. And um, in North Korea, one of the primary actors is their Reconnaissance General Bureau, one of their intelligence agencies, military intelligence agencies. But there are others as well. And within that organization, there are probably different offices with different priorities focused on cyber operations. So it's important not to lump everything into one group and start thinking through the different actors that are maybe involved. And here are the few that are particularly active these days. Uh, Velvet Chalima or uh, Kim Suki traditionally has focused on uh, breaking into think tanks, particularly think tanks that are publishing reports on North Korea universities. They're doing uh, research, Western universities, on North Korean policies. And uh, as with anything in North Korea, you have to also make money on the side. It's a very interesting regime, um, unlike any other, in that when you are a government agency and you're given certain priorities from the top, obviously a centrally planned economy, on what you're going to execute uh, in, in the case of military intelligence, what operations you may need to, to do um, in the following year, 
you're not necessarily given the full funding to execute those operations, and you're expected to make up for that shortfall somehow. And as it does often in North Korea, a lot of entrepreneurial folks that are inside those organizations realize that it would be very bad for their health and uh, would have a very limit, uh, uh, limiting impact on their life uh, to disobey uh, those orders and uh, not to execute them, even if you don't have the funding. So you have to find it elsewhere. And that's why over the years you've seen so many illicit operations originating from North Korea, whether it be currency counterfeiting, drug trafficking, and of course lately cyber. So even with this group, Kim Suki of Elva Chalima, a group that's focused on traditional intelligence collection for the purpose of informing the regime about how the world is seeing it and what different governments and uh, people outside of government are thinking about them, even when they're breaking in and doing these strategic operations, they can help themselves but not install cryptocurrency miners to make some money on the side to compensate for those shortfalls. And this group, by the way, has grown in sophistication. Increasingly, they're um, figuring out how to target non-traditional data sources, um, getting uh, browser plugins uh, like malicious Chrome plugins that we have seen over the years being developed by this group, stealing passwords from browsers like Chrome as well. Um, using web vulnerability scanners once you're inside the network to identify vulnerabilities that they can use for further proliferation. And leveraging both native tools like Navrat, um, a great Cisco Talus report on this uh, particular piece of malware that came out recently, but also open source tools like uh, Kusar Rat that is uh, openly available on GitHub. And that's another trend that we're seeing from a lot of threat actors, both sophisticated and less so, where they're increasingly using these open source tools um, or tools that are commercially available, like Cobalt Strike, to execute their operations. Stardust Chalima, Chalima or APT38, is another group that is operating out of North Korea, and they are focused almost exclusively on financial targets. So those are the groups that you've seen being part of the Bangladesh bank heist that was in the news a number of years ago, the SWIFT compromises, and on and on and on, and they're still around. Uh, you may not have heard of more uh, impressive operations like ba Bangladesh or the Bank of Chile recently, but they're still targeting smaller organizations in order to uh, ec extract money. They have not disappeared despite the warming of relations um, recently, or until recently, I should say, between the United States and, and the DPRK. Um, one of the TTPs that um, you should watch for is the use of RDP where they get in uh, either with brute force credentials or credentials that they've stolen from prior operations um, and, um, or guess those credentials uh, with kind of credential um, stuffing techniques, find an account, uh, an external service that they can RDP into, uh, use those mechanisms also for lateral movement, um, something to watch and something to consider implementing two-factor on, um, on your external RDP systems. Labyrinth Chalima is another interesting actor where Again, North Koreans, even the North Koreans, are getting into the IP theft game. Uh, you may think that the North Korean economy is not producing much of anything, but actually, over the last 10 years, there's been a focus on developing some limited private markets and enabling some level of enterprise, even though it's still very much controlled and overseen by, by the government. And as they've been trying to open up their economy and trying to escape sanctions, again, watching what the Chinese have done, watching what the other nation states are starting to do, jumping into this IP theft game is something that we're increasingly starting to see from the North Koreans. But perhaps the most interesting thing in this entire deck is really um, China. And this is uh, where I'm going to say something controversial. And I encourage uh, folks to come find me afterwards and, and try to convince me that this is not the case. But from everything I've seen and talked to lots of folks in the industry, the Chinese um, really seem to be impacted by the U.S. Justice Department actions, the indictments that we have seen, in a way that I have not seen from any other actor, not from the Iranians, not from the Russians, not from the North Koreans, who have all been indicted for various cyber operations over the years. And specifically with the Chinese, we've seen a number of indictments. Uh, the first one sort of indicted. PLA officers uh, that were part of Unit 61398. And uh, ever since that indictment, that PLA unit has basically vanished from everything that um, I've seen from industry sources. That's been really, really remarkable. It's possible that they've retooled. It's possible that they've been 
sort of sent to other units. It's possible that they've experienced some sort of punishment for getting caught. Uh, but really, in, really interesting um, tidbit. But then we've seen some of the more recent indictments of MSS contractors. Uh, this group called Boyusac, that was known as APT3 or Gothic Panda, uh, back in November of 2017. In December of 2018, another indictment of APT10 or Stone Panda. This is a group that has been going after the managed service providers that you may have uh, heard about in recent years. Both of these groups, from what I've seen and talked to others in the industry, have pretty much disappeared um, shortly after those indictments. Really, really interesting. Again, when we see the Russians being indicted, when we see the, the North Koreans get indicted, they pretty much ignore that. They move on. In this particular case, when it comes to those specific units, um, they seem to have been impacted, or at a minimum, retooled and re-emerged as new groups, which, in a way, is still a success because you're making life a lot harder for them. Now, by, by all means, the Chinese have not disappeared. There are many other groups uh, associated with MSS that are still executing high tempo of operations and now increasingly using insiders. Uh, one of the indictments from last year that was really interesting to watch from the Justice Department um, is uh, how they uh, describe the operations from MSS to recruit sometimes Chinese nationals, but often Westerners inside those companies to work for them, to give them information, sometimes to enable cyber operations. In one case in particular described in the indictment, they ask the person to plug in a USB drive into a computer loaded with malware so that they could get remote access um, enabled with physical insider to that network. So increasingly, we'll probably start to see more and more of these operations going forward. But probably one of the most interesting cases about China is what happened to the PLA. I mentioned the obama xi agreement that was struck in 2015 and the lull in activity from China, from all threat actors in China um, for a period of time afterwards. And when they reemerged, virtually everything that we in the industry were seeing was MSS-affiliated groups, not the PLA. And I've always been wondering what happened to the PLA. Now, it also happened to coincide with a major restructuring where the old uh, third Department of General Staff that was responsible for the cyber mission within the PLA was restructured into to the new strategic uh, support force um, that was created. Um, a lot of the old guard was um, kicked out of the PLA with the anti-corruption campaign that uh, President Xi had initiated. So there was a lot of turmoil that was happening internally. But the, um, uh, even, even to this day, uh, most firms that I've talked to out there, just had recently a conversation with FireEye, are not seeing PLA activity um, uh, across all the intrusions that, that we're tracking. And that is why the indictment for the Equifax breach was so interesting, where for the first time really since 2015, the Justice Department has pointed a finger at the PLA and those three operatives that you see on the slide for uh, being responsible for the Equifax breach. And um, it'll be really interesting to watch what happens. Is this um, a standalone operation? Is this part of something bigger where we'll see more and more PLA officers uh, coming to the fore? In this particular case, it was a new unit, uh, 54th Institute of the PLA that was responsible for the SAC, not affiliated with the old structure of the um, third department of general staff. So we will see what else they may be doing. It may be that their mission has been restructured towards more military on military confrontations and MSS has been the primary uh, beneficiary of the mission of collecting intellectual property and conducting economic espionage. And then Russia, as I mentioned, very low key uh, year for Russia, uh, very limited tempo of operations. The two primary actors seen uh, in 2019 were Fancy Bear and Venomous Bear, APT28 or Turtle or Snake as they're often called. And both of them have been focused on v doing very limited operations in Russia's sphere of influence where they're primarily involved in, such as Ukraine, such as Middle East. Obviously, they've got a huge presence from a military standpoint in, in Syria and, and a lot of strategic uh, interest in that area. We will see what happens, uh, whether we will s see perhaps a re res resumption of activity in uh, the United States going forward. Um, that remains to be seen. So where are we going next? 
a couple of predictions. I'll pull out my crystal ball and look at what's happening. Right at the end of last year, I was uh, doing predictions for the RSA Advisory Board, of which I'm a member. And I put forward this prediction that we are going to see some major destructive attacks from Iran in 2020 against Western targets. We have seen, obviously, a wave of wiper attacks from Iran going back to 2012 and their original hack into Aramco using the Shamoon malware, many waves of Shamoon ever since in Saudi and some other parts of the region. Uh, but since really the denial of service attacks and the operation against the Sands Casino um, that Sheldon Adelson runs, uh, we have not seen major attacks, um, uh, disruptive attacks from Iran against Western institutions. We have seen intrusions, we have seen theft of IP and collection of strategic intelligence, but we have not seen uh, the types of destructive malware that they're deploying in the region. And I thought with the escalation of activities between the U.S. And, and Iran, that was increasingly becoming likely. Little did I know that four or five days into the new year, my prediction may come true early uh, with the killing of Qusam Soleimani. We have not yet, of course, seen Iran's retaliation, but given its past history of how they retaliate, uh, both kinetically and in cyber, they tend to buy their time. They tend to wait out for the perfect moment to strike. So my prediction still holds for the year. Unfortunately, I think we we're likely to see operations in the West uh, from Iran that could be very destructive. Russia, I do, do not expect them to stay low key for, for the remainder of this year. Obviously, elections are coming up, not just in this country, but in Poland and Spain and other places that they may have strategic interest in. Uh, beyond elections, I think uh, we may see a resumption of intellectual property theft from Russia. Uh, there was a huge spike of activity early on after the takeover of Crimea in 2014, where you had um, SVR and other parts of the Russian uh, intelligence services breaking into companies, stealing IP for sectors that were under sanctions and, uh, under sanctions and couldn't uh, necessarily develop that IP indigenously or in partnership with Western firms. And as a result, uh, the Russians resorted to that tried and true tactic uh, that the Chinese have pioneered of stealing intellectual property. We may very well see a resumption of that this year. China, uh, despite the trade deal that was struck um, just about a month ago, um, I do not see uh, the Chinese stopping their activities um, in the economic espionage realm. I do believe that um, the, unfortunately, the coronavirus is going to have a huge impact on their economy. 80% um, of the Chinese uh, economy is effectively shut down at the moment. Uh, we'll see how quickly they can uh, resume that activity, but that's going to make it very, very hard for them to meet the initial targets that are outlined in the trade agreement. Um, um, the expiration for those deadlines is coming up in April. Uh, we will see if the uh, U.S. administration gives them any leeway on meeting those targets, but the tensions between us and them are likely continue to be at a heightened uh, uh, pace, and uh, we're going to continue to see intrusions from them into our private sector to help their own companies. And this IP theft trend, hopefully you've seen this throughout the course of the presentation, is going to continue. You're going to have more and more countries jumping into this sphere. We've seen Vietnam, we've seen North Korea, we've seen Pakistan. Um, India in the past as well has targeted uh, Western firms for intellectual property, South Korea. And the big question mark is, who's next? Now that this norm has been established, that we do not respond in an effective way, at least not until recently, to economic espionage being conducted against us, who else is going to decide that this is too lucrative to pass on and we should continue um, conducting those operations? That is why I think it's very, very important, again, from a policy perspective, to respond not just to the Chinese activity, but even from the activity of countries that are uh, perhaps friends of ours and let them know that we will not tolerate it, regardless of who it comes from. U.S. Five Eyes. A couple of years ago, General Nakasone, who runs the U.S. Cyber Command and the National Security Agency, has coined this phrase, persistent engagement, to describe what the U.S. and, uh, in some ways, its allies are doing in cyberspace against our enemies. The idea that we're constantly getting to their networks, 
both for intelligence collection purposes and signaling purposes, and continuously engaging with them in what they call gray space, other places around the world that both actors are operating in. That strategy is likely to get even more aggressive. Uh, restrictions on their operations have been recently relaxed by the administration. And uh, it used to be that to conduct major operations in this domain, you had to get White House approval. Now you don't. And the US is very aggressively stepping into this realm, believing um, that we are taking blows right now and that we're not responding sufficiently. And I think you'll see a lot more aggressive stance going forward um, against um, the major threat actors. More indictments and sanctions are coming. Uh, it's been amazing to watch what's happened just in the last two to three years. Uh, I remember a short time ago, six, seven years ago, when you couldn't find a single US government official in any part of the government that would say the words China and cyber even in the same sentence. And this is when industry was talking about this nonstop, doing attribution reports and all the rest of it. And the US government really had its hand, uh, head in the sand, despite the fact that from a classified sources, they knew very well what was happening, but they weren't willing to acknowledge it publicly, to now where it's seemingly every week new indictments come out, new information is released, names are um, unveiled of who is doing what across all the major threat actors, China, Iran, Russia, North Korea. I think a lot more action is coming. And one of the interesting things to note uh, has been this idea of collective attribution and collective action that the US government has been trying to pioneer. You may have seen last week the announcement from the US government and our allies, such as the UK and others that have joined in, on attribution to Russia of the recent attacks against Georgia back in the fall. And you may have wondered, well, why are they doing this action? Why are they highlighting attacks against Georgia? It's not even a NATO country. And this is one of the things that they've been increasingly thinking about of how do you get all countries on board with this name and shame tactic where we're going to name a threat actor for something that they're doing that we object to in cyberspace. And we're going to try to get as many allies, both in NATO and outside of NATO, on board with this collective demarche, collective name and shame action, and perhaps even expulsion of diplomats and other things that we have seen happen over the years. You'll see a lot more of that coming up. And one prediction is very easy to make. We're not going to have cyber peace anytime soon, I'm sorry to say. Uh, all countries in this realm are jumping into the space. We're not going to have cyber war either, I don't believe, because the reality is that the, in this domain, what's most effective is for countries to operate below that threshold of the use of force. This is where cyber really shines. If you want to have kinetic damage, there are other ways to do that. And we have seen that with Iran, with limpet mines and drone attacks and, and um, all kinds of other operations that they can do. Very, very hard to achieve that in cyber, if not impossible. But that threshold below the use of force is where you can achieve a lot without triggering a major response from the country that you are inflicting this damage on. And that's what makes this domain so hard for policymakers to respond to because it's painful enough where you can't ignore it, but the pain is not high enough for you to go to war or take uh, other major actions that uh, could potentially resonate back on our economy or on our security. A couple of other things I want to go through. Again, sort of feeling unencumbered by commercial interests. I want to give you my sort of thoughts on strategy going forward. And one of the things that I find really frustrating about walking the show floor at this conference uh, and other conferences like this is that we inundate practitioners with advice. All of it is legitimate good advice. You should use two-factor, you should use encryption, you should use, do web security, you should patch, all and on and on. But the reality is that no one can do it all. Unless your organization is the unique one out there that has unlimited resources, unlimited budget, unlimited time, you're not going to be in a position to do it all. So how do we prioritize? And when you're walking the show floor and vendors are trying to grab you in to talk to, uh, to you about their great solution, they're not just pitting, pitching their solution, but they're also trying to convince you that the problem that they're focused on, which is likely a legitimate problem, is the problem that you should spend your money on right now, ignoring everything else. And of course, part of the problem is how do you decide what's more important? Is it more important to deploy two-factor right now, or is it more important to do endpoint security, or is it more important to do web security? And the answer is really tough because it depends. It depends on your threat model. Which of these actors that we just talked about are going to be 
the most impactful to your organization? Do you even care about nation states? Do you care about ransomware? You have to think through how those actors operate, what are they likely to do in your environment, what are their um, TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures, so that you can start thinking of how to prioritize your resources against that particular threat. And the key thing that I think we need to talk more about in this industry are the trade-offs. Because nothing is free, not just in terms of monetary out outcomes, but also in terms of time, in terms of res resources. And you need to appreciate that when you're doing one thing, let's say deploying two-factor, you're probably not doing something else. And how do you prioritize that really depends on your strategy. Right? If your network is um, very well insulated, maybe you only have a couple of ways in, and it's going to be very, very hard for someone to infiltrate it. Maybe your resources need to be spent more on hygiene of those um, external assets um, that um, uh, are going to be the way in for an attacker. You can sort of have that choke point and stop them there. If your network is more distributed, if you have employees everywhere working remotely, maybe you need to take the strategy of someone is going to get through, they're going to get in, let's hunt for them, let's find them before they accomplish any damage. And we need to start thinking more about those trade-offs as we're making decisions about how to employ our security solutions. A couple other trends that I want to talk about before we end. So first of all, obviously, you know, I'm biased because this is uh, what I'm doing with the next phase of my life, but I believe policy truly is the next frontier. I think the tech sector in general and cybersecurity industry more specifically has made a huge mistake in the last 20 years by not appreciating the power of governments. Not just the power of governments in doing cyber operations, but the power of government to regulate us and make our lives very, very difficult. I remember the talk back in the 90s and even early 2000s that there are no borders, borders on the internet. Uh, well, that was nonsense. Uh, there are absolutely borders. Um, physical infrastructure lives somewhere. Companies operate somewhere. Their people are in various locations. Government can use the power of their law enforcement, the power of their um, economies to force us to do things we don't like. And regulations are coming. Obviously, we've seen GDPR. We've seen the California privacy law that went into effect uh, this year. But I can tell you, as someone who lives in DC, policymakers are uniquely interested in the space right now. And they're not interested in uh, doing less regulations. There's a lot of talk right now on so-called Section 230, uh, which is part of the Communications Decency Act, related to giving liabilities to big platform companies about content that they have on their uh, systems very likely that liability uh, provision will either go away entirely. Uh, there's bipartisan support for that now, given what's been happening on Facebook and Twitter and all these different platforms the last couple of years, or it'll be changed very radically going forward. Encryption, I remember living through the 90s in the first crypto war. Uh, we're in the second phase of it now, or maybe the 10th, depending on how you count it. Uh, you heard the Justice Department yesterday talking about it here at this conference. They want to do something on this. They believe they have bipartisan support um, uh, for um, uh, getting some sort of provision to require tech companies to enable access. We'll see what comes out of that. But um, given some of the terrorist attacks that have been occurring recently, given the uh, incredible rise in child exploitation cases, um, there's a lot of political support to do something. Um, and um, that's usually not a good thing when the, the politicians want to do something, but they don't know exactly what. Very rarely, something good comes of that. Data breach laws, a lot of talk about national data breach notification law. Something may happen in the next couple of years there. And one of the things that is important to realize is we've had tremendous amount of talk and energy expended over the last few years talking about norms. Um, and there's been this group uh, inside the UN of major countries, GGE, um, that was focused on how do we come together and establish norms like not hitting civilian infrastructure, not attacking countries' certs, and a number of other things that they've been promoting. And the reality is, is that all of that effort was pretty much useless, I'm sorry to say, because norms have been established de facto, either through government action in this domain or lack of it. So when we have not responded to economic espionage, we've established a norm that has now resulted in this massive proliferation in IP theft that's been taking place from a variety of different countries against us. When we take action in cyberspace, we're establishing a norm that that action is allowed. And we need to be very cognizant of that. And private sector is not going to be a neutral party to this fight. I believed even 10 years ago that if you're in the cybersecurity industry, you're going to be forced to take a side. 
you can be sort of an arms dealer selling even defensive tools to everyone. And we're starting to see that with controversies over Huawei, Kaspersky, and others coming to the fore. That's only going to be exacerbated going forward. If you think that as a cybersecurity organization, you're going to be able to do business in Russia or China, or even broader IT organizations in the near future, I think you're, you're deluding yourself. Technology, I want to spend a couple of um, minutes talking about the trends that I'm seeing there. Because I do think we're going to see some really remarkable changes coming to the fore in terms of how adversaries are leveraging these new capabilities that are, that are coming forward. The reality is that offense is getting harder and harder. When you think about the cost of compromising an iPhone device or even an Android device, that has been ri risen dramatically over the years into the hundreds of thousands of dollars to buy those exploits, to purchase the malware that can run on them. And increasingly, the companies have done a great job of shoring up uh, those platforms, those operating systems, both on the mobile device side as well as on the uh, traditional operating si system side, creating these walled gardens where it's very difficult to operate, but not impossible. And one of the trends that I think we're going to see going forward is that persistence for malware will migrate down to the application. So instead of getting your malware to live in the kernel, which is going to be harder and harder. Apple just basically kicked out everyone out of the kernel with the latest update that's coming up um, in, a, in a few weeks here, uh, including security vendors, by the way. But instead of living there, you're going to say, I'm going to live in the browser. And yes, I'm going to lose access upon a reboot, potentially. Uh, so the notion of persistence where I can put my malware on a system, and until I'm discovered for months or years, I'm going to li live there, I think that notion is going away. And offensive teams are starting to appreciate that you may have to reacquire targets continuously, or you may have to do smash and grab operations to quickly accomplish your objective. And to the extent that you need to maintain persistence, it may be in the browser, it may be in the messaging app someone's using. That's where you're going to persist some of your code in memory to try to accomplish your objectives. And that's also going to be very, make it very difficult for defenders to find it because those tools are not as instrumented as the operating system. Your ability to get visibility into what's going on inside those processes is very limited, and it's going to create all sorts of new challenges for us. Kubernetes, containers, obviously very, very hot technology. Most organizations are either toying with it right now or deploying those technologies. And we're going to see um, them become a really the new operating system. Uh, new attacks are going to emerge. They're specifically targeting Kubernetes APIs. Um, container technologies. Um, so we're not just going to see attacks on traditional operating systems, traditional applications. You need to start thinking about that whole ecosystem as its own standalone unit. And the thing that I worry the most about is source code manipulation. We have seen some supply chain attacks, uh, most famously with the Juniper uh, code that was uh, backdoored, and a number of security vendors have experienced the same thing. I'm surprised we have not seen more of these. And it's quite possible that they have occurred, and we just haven't caught them. When you have insider, particularly in your organization, not in an external threat actor that is putting backdoors in your code that is authorized to do so, really, really hard to catch in modern, massive source code systems. Obviously, you also have added risks to open, from open source packages and the like um, that um, gets added to, to this. And then strategy, last point. Uh, Stanley Baldwin, the UK Prime Minister in the 1930s, um, in the lead up to World War II, uh, in his argument that the UK should not be rearming in the wake of Germany rearming, he said, the bomber will always get through, in a way saying that it's futile to, um, to fight because there will be massive destruction when these air forces that have been uh, built by nations after World War I will start flying in and destroying cities and, and making life unbearable for populations. He was wrong, and it turns out that you can actually inflict massive costs on air forces with technologies like radar and uh, uh, AAA um, missiles and the like. But in cyber, it actually is true, because the costs that you can inflict on someone just by catching them are actually very, very limited. Um, and that's why we continue to see these intrusions happening where the adversaries can keep on trying until they're successful. And the assumption does need to be, I believe, that you will have an intrusion doesn't mean you'll have a compromise, but you need to react faster. The good news is that stealth is becoming harder and harder. Adversaries are getting caught more frequently, and dwell time is coming down dramatically, uh, as we've just recently seen from the Mandiant M Trends report as well. So people are catching them faster. Needs to be a lot faster than, than, 
than now, but, but never less. Deterrence, largely ineffective. That's something that I'm going to be passionate about over the next phase of my career, working on those issues. And inside infiltrations at large tech companies, both cybersecurity companies and large platform companies, going to be a huge issue. Twitter recently saw a problem with Saudis infiltrating um, people inside their networks. Persistent engagement. Everyone in this room is persistently engaged with adversary. It's not just a term that US Cyber Command uses. And finally, the silver lining I'll end the talk on is that offenses against hard target is actually becoming more and more costly. So companies that are doing well, organizations that are doing well, are actually able to defend themselves, even against the most sophisticated adversaries. You just need to make it a priority and invest in it. Thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. And I hope to have your help in the future. Thank you.